High above the city stood the fine statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded all over with gold leaf, and his eyes were bright sapphires. A large red ruby was in his sword. He is as beautiful as a weather vane, said one of the town councillors, who wished to be known for his artistic tastes. One little boy in the city was crying for the moon, and his mother asked him, Why can't you be like the happy prince, who never dreams of crying for anything? Everyone loved the happy prince statue in the city. He looks like an angel, remarked the children of the school. Their math teacher asked, How would you know? Have you ever seen an angel? Of course, said the children, in our dreams. One day a lonely swallow landed on the happy prince for a rest. He nestled in between the statue's feet to go to sleep. But just as he was about to fall asleep, a large drop of water fell on the swallow. The swallow saw no clouds and could not understand where these drops were coming from. The swallow looked up and saw the statue's eyes were full of teardrops, and that is where the drops were coming from. Who are you? asked the swallow. Well, I am the happy prince, said the statue. Why are you crying? asked the swallow. I was a happy human prince my whole life, and when I died, they put me up here to see all the city's sadness, and so I weep. I can see a very sad seamstress, who has a very sick son. She is so very poor. Swallow, swallow, will you bring her the ruby from my sword, asked the happy prince statue. Oh, but I must be leaving to meet my swallow family, said the swallow. Oh, swallow, swallow, little swallow, will you not stay with me for just one day and help me? The swallow agreed to stay and help to be the messenger for the prince. He flew the ruby to the seamstress's house in the night and laid the precious red stone beside her thimble. He cooled her sick child with a flutter of his wings, and the boy began to feel better. The swallow flew back to the prince to tell him all was done. I will leave tomorrow. Please, swallow, stay one more night to help me, the happy prince asked the swallow. He asked the swallow to take one of his sapphire eyes to help a poor playwright to finish his play. The little swallow snuck into the playwright's room and left the sapphire. The playwright was overwhelmed and could not believe his luck. The swallow returned to tell the happy prince how happy the playwright was. The swallow said goodbye, but the prince asked for his help again. To give his other sapphire eye to the little match girl in the square below. But if I pluck out your eye, you will be blind. Do not worry, little swallow. Go and join your family now. But the little swallow insisted on staying forever with the happy prince. The happy prince asked the swallow to take each leaf of his gold to help the poor in his city. And so the swallow did, as the happy prince asked, leaving the happy prince looking quite dull. The swallow stayed too long and the cold winter made him very sick. He knew he was going to die. He told the prince he loved him and kissed him on the lips before falling at the statue's feet to his death. At that moment, a strange cracking noise sounded from inside the statue. The leaded heart of the statue had been broken. The city councillors took down the happy prince statue as it no longer was gold with precious rubies and sapphires. They found a dead bird at its feet and sent everything to be taken away to the garbage. God was looking down and sent two of his angels to bring the two most precious things from the city to him. 
The angels found the dead bird and the broken leaded heart and statue and brought them to God. God thanked them so much. He brought the little swallow back to life and repaired the statue and his broken heart. And he put them in his Garden of Eden for the little swallow to sing forever and live with his happy prince statue. Once there was a little farm with a pond full of geese and ducks. On a fine spring morning, a mother duck felt her eggs start to crack beneath her. One by one, all the eggs broke open, with each new baby duckling cuter than ever. Until the last egg broke open. The duckling did not look like the other cute little ducklings. He was gray and clumsy and way too big. The mother duck thought, how big and clumsy this duckling is. But she loved him just as much as the other ducklings. The next day, the mother duck took her ducklings to meet the other farm animals. As soon as they entered the farmyard, the other animals started to call the gray duckling names. Look at the ugly duckling, said a mean old goose. Soon, his own brothers and sisters were calling him names. They called him Ugly Duckling. This went on for days, and the Ugly Duckling decided to run far away. He ran deep into the field. He finally came upon a pond full of geese. It was nighttime, so he fell asleep in the tall grass surrounding the pond. In the morning, the ugly duckling was just about to meet the geese when they were scared by a hunter and his dogs. The ugly duckling stayed in the long grass and hid from the hunter and his scary dogs. When he was sure they were gone, he started to walk towards a cottage he could see. An old woman lived there with her prize hen and cat. The old woman let the ugly duckling stay because she thought she could fatten up the duck to sell him at the market. The prize hen and the cat were very rude to the ugly duckling. And besides, there was no water for him to swim on here. So the ugly duckling snuck away one night to find a lake. He found a nice lake but none of the other birds spoke to him. They thought he was too ugly to bother with. One day, a beautiful flock of white birds with long necks flew overhead. The ugly duckling began to cry, but he had no idea why. It was getting colder and soon all the other birds left the pond because winter was coming. The ugly duckling stayed and awoke one morning to find his feet frozen in the lake. A nice, kind farmer found the ugly duckling and saved him. He thought he would be a nice house pet for his children, so he brought the ugly duckling home. His wife and children were not very happy with the ugly duckling, and so the ugly duckling snuck away to find a new home. It was winter, and the ugly duckling found a spot on a pond's edge. He built a nest. He was safely hidden to snuggle away the whole winter. Finally, spring arrived, and the pond thawed. The ugly duckling spread his wings. He found his wings grew very strong during the winter. The ugly duckling landed gracefully on the lovely pond. Just as he landed, he noticed three snowy swans near the pond shore. He felt the same way he had had the first time he saw them fly overhead. The ugly duckling slowly swam over to meet the swans. And then, 
as the ugly duckling swam, he noticed his own reflection. What do you think he saw? His own reflection was that of a beautiful white swan. You see, over the winter, the ugly gray duckling had grown into a beautiful, white, graceful swan. And he was the most beautiful bird of all. The new swans welcomed their new swan friend. The swans were so very nice to the ugly duckling, who was now a stunning white swan. The ugly duckling promised himself he would never forget the lessons he had learned as a young ugly duckling, as he lived happily ever after with his new family on the beautiful pond. A long time ago, a beautiful young woman was forced to live in an enchanted castle with a hideous beast. Belle had agreed to be his prisoner in place of her father. Belle soon discovered that she and the beast were not the only people living in the enchanted castle. To her surprise, she found out that the former servants of the castle had been magically transformed into everyday objects. A teapot, a teacup, a candelabra, a clock. Meanwhile, the beast was very nervous. A long, long time ago, the evil witch who had turned him from a handsome prince into an ugly beast had warned him that he must learn to love and be loved to break the spell and turn back into a handsome prince. He had lost all hope until he met Belle. He was afraid she would never ever see him as a prince, but only as a monster. She is so beautiful and just look at me, he shouted to the servants. Mrs. Potts, the teapot, told him. You must help her see past all that, she said. The candelabra agreed with Mrs. Potts. They told the beast to be a gentleman, compliment her, be kind, gentle, and sincere, but mostly to control his temper. The beast invited Belle to dinner, but she said, no thank you. The beast got very angry and roared, if she doesn't eat with me, she doesn't eat at all. Despite their master's orders, Mrs. Potts secretly fed Belle dinner. Mrs. Potts and the other servants entertained Belle and they all laughed and sang, Be our guest! <laughs> Belle was very fond of all the servants, but wanted nothing to do with the beast. Only after he proved that he cared by protecting her from the wolves did she begin to trust him. Slowly over time, they became friends. One day, as they played in the snow, Belle watched the beast hand-feed the birds, and she realized there was a side of him she had never seen before. A kind and gentle side. The beast was so happy that Belle was no longer afraid of him. The beast wanted to give Belle a special gift for bringing happiness back into his life. He asked Belle to cover her eyes, and he led her into an enormous library. Belle could not believe her eyes when she saw all of the books. They're all yours, said the beast. He knew how much she loved books. Oh, thank you so much, she smiled. Belle read many books to the beast, and their friendship grew very strong. They each found they could talk and laugh with each other as they could with no one else. One night, a very special evening was planned. The beast wanted everything to be perfect. He worried very much about how he looked. The candelabra and mantel clock helped him to get ready. They told the beast how handsome and elegant he looked. When he saw Belle looking so beautiful in her ball gown, the beast bowed. At dinner, the beast was the perfect gentleman, and when Mrs. Potts began to sing a love song, the beast asked Belle to dance. She said yes, and they danced in each other's arms. The servants watching from the doorway were so happy for the beast. 
They would not have guessed that the beast's love for Belle would send her away. But he told Belle she was free to go. He could no longer keep her a prisoner. Belle left to visit her sick father. The beast's heart was broken. Villagers attacked his castle and he could not fight. He let them come in. Belle realized she belonged with the beast and returned to find him. Belle found the beast wounded and dying. At least I get to see you one last time, said the beast, gazing into Belle's eyes. No, cried Belle. I love you. All of a sudden, a great beam of light beamed down on the beast. He returned to his human form. Belle stared at the handsome prince in front of her. Belle, it's me, he assured her. Looking deep into his eyes, she saw her friend's gentleness and love. It is you, Belle cried, and she kissed him joyfully. Fireworks lit up the sky, and all the servants became humans again. To celebrate this great event, the prince and Belle had a fantastic ball in their shining perfect castle. Belle wore her stunning evening gown, and the prince looked handsome and dashing. All the servant friends attended the grand ball as well. Belle and the prince danced in each other's arms all night. It was very clear for all to see how much they were in love. Belle and the prince lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, a lovely mermaid named Ariel rescued a drowning prince from a shipwreck. Ariel's father had forbade her to swim to the surface, but she had to to save the prince. Ariel wanted to be part of the human world so badly. Somehow she would find a way. As she touched the prince's face, she wished with all her heart that she could stay on the beach and dance with this man of her dreams. As the prince lay unconscious, she sang to him. What would I do to see you smiling at me, she sang. Her father's trusted friend tried to convince Ariel that being under the sea was her home and she would be much happier living her life there instead of the human world. The Sea King had asked his friend to keep an eye on his daughter. But despite all the king's friend's efforts, he could not convince her because she was in love with the prince. The fish, her only best friend, was the only one who understood her. Her fish friend surprised Ariel with a statue of the prince that had sunk with the shipwreck. Oh, thank you so much, my friend, Ariel said. The statue looks exactly like him. Just then, her father the Sea King found Ariel in her secret grotto with her collection of things from the world above the sea. He destroyed all of her treasures in an attempt to protect her from the dangers of the human world. Ariel was so upset. She sought out the help of the sea witch. The sea witch made a deal with Ariel. In exchange for the mermaid's voice, the witch would transform Ariel's mermaid tail into legs. The sea witch told Ariel she would remain human only if she received a kiss of true love before the sunset on the third day. As Ariel wiggled her newly found toes, the sea king's trusted friend knew he had to tell the king but he knew Ariel would be so sad as a mermaid. The king's friend agreed to help Ariel find the prince. Ariel's seagull friend helped her find a dress and it wasn't long before the prince arrived. You are the one, he exclaimed. The one I have been searching for. Ariel <laughs> nodded but could not speak. 
But the girl who rescued me had the most beautiful voice, said the prince. Perhaps you are not the girl I have been searching for. Still, the prince helped her to the castle, and they had dinner that night. Ariel made the prince <laughs> laugh for the first time in weeks. He showed her around his kingdom the next day, and was enchanted by her enthusiasm for everything, from horses to puppet shows. The prince thoroughly enjoyed Ariel, and that night they went for a quiet romantic boat ride. As the prince leaned in to kiss Ariel, the sea witch made her pet eels tip the boat. Then the sea witch hypnotized the prince and transformed herself, pretending to be his mysterious dream girl. She arranged a wedding right away to make sure all of Ariel's plans would fail. Ariel's seagull bird friend gathered all of her ocean friends to help Ariel defeat the sea witch's evil plans. Her friends fought the sea witch and won, and Ariel's voice was restored. And the spell on the prince was broken. He realized Ariel was his true love, but it was too late, and Ariel was a mermaid again. The evil sea witch dragged Ariel back into the sea, but the strong prince would not lose his true love again, and he fought and destroyed the evil sea witch. The sea king and his trusted friend watched, and the sea king could see how much his daughter loved the prince. So, he granted her wish to marry the prince. All of Ariel's great sea friends applauded as the prince and Ariel were married and they lived happily ever after.